want to take you on a journey uh, which changed my life from the age of 15 up to the present day. And I hope that my life will continue to be embalmed within physical mediumship. Um, but before we start, I just need to let you know the difference between a mental medium and a physical medium. A mental medium is someone like Phil and Kerry, Mark Anthony and others who are on this course will stand on this platform and through their senses relay information from a deceased mind. I say a medium only gives in information because it's once the information is taken, that becomes the evidence that the medium is connected with the discarnate mind. A physical medium can sit here and everyone will hear it. If you are mediumistic or not, you will all hear the voices, you will all hear and feel the experiences of the spirit as they move through the mind of the instrument. But many years ago, being a very rude, crude boy, at the age of 15, I'm painfully shy, which is strange, really. After a few drinks, I do table dancing. Um, <laughs> but we'll get to that as we go along. You know, pe you know people say we do table tilting? Well, I do table dancing. <laughs> I prove that the spirit can move me but not the discarnate spirit, something which is in a bottle. Anyway, so let me just give you a little bit of history. I come from a very loving family, a very logical family. Uh, my father um, was a professional boxer. He um, gave it up many years ago. He used to bench press cars. He was a big man. He was a man's man. Um, and he always wanted a son. And out I popped. <laughs> I walked out the womb, waving my umbilical cord, and said, hi, guys, I'm here. <laughs> but I was the last one to be born. I have uh, two living older sisters and one who's much older in the other world. But we'll come to Emma in just a moment. I was a logical, rational guy whose dad wanted me to do sports, become a boxer, etc. And he said, you'll always defend yourself. So I was not going to be conned. I'm very skeptical, and I need to get that across. I am very skeptical. I'm also very vicious in the sense of the spirit world saved my life. If you are working with the spirit, I'll become your best friend. If you fraud or play on the bereaved or vulnerable, I become vicious. Because unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, there are people who play lip service to the spirit and there are others who are moved by the power. So, many years ago, I did the UK lottery. And if you got six numbers, you'll be a multi-millionaire. And I got a five numbers. And I was like, woohoo! Um, and I won a little bit of money. It was a lot for my age, but it was spent within two days. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a fabulous time. <laughs> so. I've always wanted to buy a computer. I've always had second-hand goods. I've always had hand-me-down clothes. And for once, I had the funds to buy myself a brand new computer, which was a PlayStation. <laughs> I wanted a PlayStation. So I went to a computer shop, and it was called Game Mania. I went in there, and I said, right, I would like this. And she said, instead of spending your money, go next door and have a reading, which I thought was a sales technique. I, because when you can't have something, you want it more, don't you? So I'm sitting there going, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So I ran next door, and I, I expected <laughs> to meet a lady with a big tea towel, big earrings, big crystal ball, and all of that, because that's what I thought it was all about. I was right beside the tea towel. She had big earrings, she had a crystal ball, uh, everything like that. And she started to tell me stuff about my life. Only I knew. However, I'm from a a small town, and everyone in my town knew my family because of my dad's personality. So I thought, babe, she must be lying to me. So I paid me 20 pounds, went next door again, and the shop was closed. <laughs> you know when you're actually licking the window, going, no! Because <laughs> I really wanted this computer. So over the next couple of days, I was planning, right, this is what we're going to do with the money, etc., etc. And then I got a random call from a lady called Brenda Sheridan. And she said, are you Scott Milligan? I went, hello. And she said, 
um, we've just conducted a physical seance and your details are being given. And I thought, crazy woman, I put down the phone. Because <laughs> I thought she was after my money. The phone rang again and she said, I, we must have got, got cut off, but I must insist where there's a physical seance and your details are being given, we would like you to go and see John Austin. Okay, there's something inside me telling me, listen, couldn't put it down. Have any of you had that feeling like, I need to do this, but I don't know why. However, let's see where it goes. So I said, yeah, all right then. So she goes, right, we'll come round, we'll collect you, and we'll take you to Brighton. And just on the outskirts of Brighton is a place called Hove. And next to that is Port Slade. So we were on the boundaries of it. So I got picked up, and I went in the car, and it was that awkward conversation because this lady was like so ready to die. She was so old. And <laughs> you're thinking, what kind of thing am I going to talk about? You know, I got a PlayStation. <laughs> and so it was an awkward silence in that car journey. It was like, all right. Um, and then I was met by a lovely old man, uh, ex army. He said, uh, hi, I'm John, you must be Scott. And started telling me all about certain things, like your mother's mother's in the other world, your father's mother's still alive, you've been lucky just recently. And he was telling me stuff. And I said, how did you know this? And he said, my wife told me. So I said, can I meet your wife? He said, you will. So I said, oh, okay. So he said, you're having these experiences, and I would like you to see if we can sit and to develop these experiences. So I went, OK. And he said, I want to do the Ouija board. And I've gone, <gasps> I said, I'm not doing that. As he pulls out the board, I feel like, first of all, first of all, I have to confess, I'm dyslexic. So when they spell out something, it's a horror film for me, because I can't read. I'm like, you might as well have it in Braille. Um, so. As he got the board out, and, he, and I said, no, I'm not doing it. And he said, do you think this is going to hurt you? And I said, yes. And he picked up the board, and he hit me with it. <laughs> so I got, I'm being from that background where if someone hurts you, you're going to hurt them back. So I'm getting ready to climb over the table and literally end this guy's life with the planchette. <laughs> and he said, put your finger on there. <laughs> OK, can I have a tissue, please, because my nose is bleeding. <laughs> And the moment we put our hand on that, within a few moments, it spelt out Milligan sit. Milligan sit. Milligan sit. And it spelt it out so fast, I couldn't work out how this was being done. At points, the board would spin by itself, but the glass would stay still. And I'm not watching, thinking, it must be magnets. And I said, when? And it said, now, now, now. OK. Let's go into the other room. OK, so you go through his bedroom. You think, this is weird. And then you go into a room, which is like a living room, which has all, had all the windows boarded up, painted red, red carpet, chairs in a big circle. And he says, sit in that chair and close your eyes. So, and that was my instruction. So I said, OK. So I sat there, closed my eyes, thinking, this is awkward. And um, didn't become aware of anything. Nothing. No, nothing happened. So I opened my eyes, and he said, hmm. He said, do you want to go and see the medium that I developed? So I said, yeah, of course. And he said, his name's Colin Fry. So I said, OK. He lives in Hayward Heath. And I said, what's the next town from me? He said, oh, fantastic. Go there. So I was met by a room of about 30 people. Hi, you're Scott. I said, hi, yeah, OK. Can't remember your names, but I just did the curtsy as I was shaking everyone's hands. And um, in came Colin. And he said, well, you must be Scott. I've heard so much about you. And I said, John's wife? Yes. I said, well, we'd really like to meet John's wife. And he said, oh, just be still. This is your chair. A lady called Marlene on this side, Joan Averson on this side. And I said, I've got a PlayStation. Because I, <laughs> I didn't know what to talk about. What do you talk about? You know, do you come here often? And they were sealing the door up. And I thought, this is strange. And then all of a sudden, they started to turn down the lights. Now, I'm scared of the dark. And I looked over for help, and there's Colin being tied to a chair. <laughs> Where the hell am I going? <laughs> and it was so nervous, because why are you tying this man down? And I was told to be quiet, just sit there. OK. 
Um, they drew a curtain around him. Then the white light went off. Red light was on. And I'm thinking, this is really strange. How am I going to describe this? And then all of a sudden, the light went out. And unknown to me, there's a microphone here recording the proceedings. So all you can hear is me going, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <coughs> yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And we're going to sing. <laughs> and I only sing when I'm really, really drunk. So um, we started singing Drunken Sailor, Ure and Up She Rose. And when we got to Ure Up She Rose, the trumpet, which is very similar to this, lifted off the ground and started flying around the room. Me being a perfect specimen man screamed and grabbed hold of the people either side of me. And Marlene turned around and said, don't move. And I'm, I'm squeezing for dear life. Have any of you been there when you're really panicking, you're squeezing, <laughs> thinking, it's like pumping a heart, <laughs> like this. And the trumpet flew around, and by this point, it's now here in front of me. And Marlene piped up and said, is that you, Charlie? And the trumpet did this. She said, oh, I'm so excited it's Scott's first time. Now, I said something which is quite rude, and I'm not really proud of it at all. But it's now immortalized for eternity because it's been recorded, and it rhymed with witch. So I said, shut up, like that. Because the voice then came out and said, is it, mister? Let me get my legs. What do you mean legs? And you heard the legs forming, and you heard a child run from the corner of the room straight over to me and took my hand without fumbling. He must have found me because I was hyperventilating. But <laughs> the moment he touched my hand, he grabbed my hand, he said, nice to meet you, mister. God, you got big hands. And he kicked my feet and said, you got big plates and all. He ran back into the, cub, uh, the cabinet, and out came this elderly man, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Alec Guinness. And you hear me on the recorder saying, who the hell's Alec Guinness? <laughs> he replied, said, young man, I was always known as Obi-Wan bloody Kenobi. And I went, as you do, oh my god, the force is strong with you. <laughs> Which was met with complete silence. <laughs> I felt as popular as a fart in a, sp a space suit. <laughs> you, know? I just, you know when you just want the ground to open up and just die? And I said to him, could you sign this piece of paper because my dad wouldn't believe me? And he turned around and said, no. And I thought, rude, rudeness. And <laughs> Alex spoke and went back into the cab uh, cabinet. And then all of a sudden, what I can only describe as hearing voices which were recognized. Coming to the end of the demonstration, Colin and his chair was lifted up in the air, moved across, and dropped directly in front of me where the chair leg has dropped in between my legs and his legs are on the other side of me. Me being the fine specimen man, screamed. The light came on, I screamed even more. Um, <laughs> and I ran out the room. As I ran out the room, I didn't have a mobile phone at those days, so I ran home, picked up the phone, phoned up John, I said, yes, I want it. And he said, now go away for one month and learn manners. So I said, OK. And he said, I want you to stay close to my medium while we prepare a circle for you. So I said, OK. I sat for seven and a half years every night in a different materialization seance, going from Colin Fry, David Thompson, Stuart Alexander, Joan Averson, and Polly, seeing the most extraordinary things. So I just wanted to show you how I started to come into this. Now I'm going to take you into Colin's work and show you this extraordinary man who was able to heal the lives of many. There will be photographs which I'll show you which we were able to capture with Colin's mediumship as well as others. And I would like you to come on a journey with me, if that's OK. So let's get rid of that. Let's push that along. Oh. Oh. Do you like the way I'm doing that? It's like it's supposed to work. <laughs> I like it how I carried on doing it. <laughs> so um, this is just a, a, a very old photograph of uh, Mag Fry. Who's this lady here? Arthur, and then there's Colin. He, Colin has a brother called Glenn. A lot of people knew him to be the TV medium, but I knew him to be the trance and physical medium. He uh, was born on the 19th of May, 1962. And a big part of me went, 
on the 25th of August 2015. He died of lung cancer. He also had something else wrong with his blood as well. This gentleman, I, I, this is strange because I always knew Colin to have long hair. So when I see these photos, I'm like, that's not the Colin I really truly remembered. But during the seances, we have a substance that leaves our body called ectoplasm, white substance. When ectoplasm exudes from the medium's body and just sits there and does nothing, it's known as teleplasm, devoid of life. If it starts to move, it becomes ectoplasm of life. Ectoplasm is a part of the life force of the medium and life force of all of you. Each of you are able to produce this substance, but for whatever defects uh, I have as well as other people have, I can produce much more of it under the right conditions. It's extremely light sensitive in the early stages of the unfoldment, but as time goes on, depending on the genetic makeup of the medium, we can introduce light or capture photographs that you see, which we will present to you today. Colin was strapped to the chair with um, thick ties. He was always searched and very strictly kept in that chair as much as possible. There was an instance back a few years before this photograph was taken, which happened in the skull experiment, where there's many people's views on this. I can tell you John's view, and John had no reason to lie to me, was that when Colin was strapped down, that the binds, for whatever reason, either snapped or there was teeth marks through them where they were bitten, and he was out the chair. When the light came on, the people saw him to have the trumpet in his hand, because there was two circles, there was the inner circle and the outer circle. The outer circle saw the trumpet in his hand, the inner circle saw him off the ground. He hemorrhaged from his back passage, he coughed up blood, and he was bleeding from his eye after the lighter came on. So that's John's version. Other people say he was for, you know, faking the sit-ins. I was not present, so I have no view on this. However, the seances that I sat with him, I could find no logical reason besides it must be coming from the spirit world. So this substance can come out of any orifice. That includes ears, eyes, nose, mouth, nip-nips, <laughs> belly button, and toilet area. It can come through the pores of the skin. It can also come through your gland system. I'm going to mispronounce it, so I'm going to ask Kevin to help me if I mispronounce it, the medulla oblongata gland. Did I say it right? No, let me show you how to say it. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> that's one. Say that when you're drunk. <laughs> exactly what I said. I don't know what's wrong with you, Kevin. <laughs> Which is seated at the back here. Um, also, it can come from the collarbone area. Oh, I've got to be careful because there's a microphone there. But around this area here. It is a very peculiar substance. It can come out as a gas but once it hits the atmosphere, it becomes solid. So in 1999, after eight years of development, we were able to capture just a limited amount of photographs with Colin. He became very ill after each photograph, which showed that whatever we were doing to the phenomena, it was having an effect on him. So you can see it coming from his ears and nose. And I have to make it absolutely clear Photographs do not do justice unless you are present. This could be staged and faked. And this is why photographs for me are only important for the people who are in the room at that moment. But it just helps to build the picture of what is occurring in the dark. Again, you see the ectoplasm coming from his ears. It's over from the back of his head, uh, also near the crown, and from his nose. It smells when it comes out of him. It smells of boiled cabbage. It smells of wet earth. It can smell of sulfur. It can also smell of whatever the medium has eaten. Now, if you've got the smell of boiled cabbage, and I have to say boiled cabbage, ooh, could you imagine <laughs> this substance, as it's being moved from him, your loved one's going to step into that. And yes, if there's a smell of boiled cabbage of a loved one coming towards me, I go, yep, yeah, that was my nan because that's how she smelled. But when a loved one walked into the ectoplasm, the smell would disappear, and it would smell of roses. Because could you imagine trying to hug someone? You're like, oh, God, that's bad. 
Um, but you'll smell roses, which is interesting because Colin was a heavy smoker. And at all the points of the demonstration, the forms which will come over had no smell of nicotine on them whatsoever. However, if you went towards Colin, there was a smell of nicotine because he would smoke in his clothes, which he sits in. So you would smell it on his fingers and you can smell it on his breath. Especially if you're a non-smoker, you can definitely smell it. However, whenever the forms came out, you had no sense of any disruptive smell on there whatsoever. Now, if I just explain this, and it will come much more easy as we go along. This is called an ectoplasmic rod, or pseudopod, it's called. It is an energy face form which has been coated in ectoplasm, and this rod then connects itself to a trumpet. So you'll see it looks like a hose sticking out the stomach of the medium, and that will then float around the room. That's why they can move this round very, very fast, because it's on a rod system. Now, on Colin's photo, you'll notice, as the rod goes up, there's a, like a mass here. This is a deflated voice box. A voice box is where the spirit people will move their thoughts into it and recreate the closest thing as their human voice. Now, when we've pushed the spirit people and said, how do you use the voice box? They said, we have to think how we sound. Now, in my perfect world, I think I sound all manly and butch until I hear myself on a tape recorder and I think, oh my God, that's not how I think I sound. So when the loved one is trying to communicate, they're trying to think how they sound. So it may not be exact replica, but if your loved one used to call you pet, Peter, or something like that, the first words out of the voice box should be the nickname that they used to call you. So sometimes they can get the voice box painfully accurate, sometimes it's slightly off, and sometimes they need an enabler, which is the person like Daniel, which then has to assist the communication. But this voice box can range from the size of your fist up to a very large basketball. It can have lips, but it may not have any teeth. They have to create an air system in the voice box which is normally connected to the medium. So when I wake up and they do the voice box and the voice is away from me, I can note that when the voice starts to talk, it feels like I take a deep breath in. So they're using my lung system to power the voice box. They also paralyze your vocal cords, so you can't actually make sensible sounds while the voice is actually speaking. It's more like a <laughs> noise as the voice is speaking. We are trying to get my voice talking at the same time as a voice box. However, it's a slow process. Because I think it would be awesome if I can go one, two, three, four, five, and then the voice of the voice box coming back and still talking at the same time, which shows it's a discarnate voice. We have used voice correlation. And the voice correlation, when it comes through the voice box, it comes up non-human which we find very, very interesting. And we would like to take this further to see if they can bring people who's had their voices captured on tape recorder, which we can then uh, pass through a machine and see if the vibration um, decimals are the same. If it's not the same voice, but the same tone within that. But it's a slow process. But it's just the same photo, but just on a lighter bit. So trumpet phenomena. The reason they do trumpet phenomena, and this is why I'm, I'm going to tell you about the terminology and then we go into the history, if that's okay, because it makes more sense. So the purpose of a trumpet, besides exciting you, because it glows in the dark, is to amplify the voice. So the trumpet can float around and then go onto your shoulder and you'll hear a whisper through the trumpet. So if they want to tell you something without anyone else knowing, they'll put it close to your ear, like they did many years ago, and they turned around to me and said, be careful what you're drinking. I went, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you're drinking. Be careful what I'm drinking. And then the voice came out and said, we were trying to make it a secret. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and normally the trumpet will do that and then float away. So as you can see in this one here, this is Collins. It's a wooden one. It has Magnus, Dolly, and Charlie Carter written on it. And it floated up the wall. 
Because we were taking photographs in the dark, we didn't know how to position the camera. And unfortunately, we've got the curtain concealing Colin. It would have been more awesome if we were able to get Colin in the shot as well with the trumpet separate. They are using psychic phenomena for this experiment because you see no ectoplasm connected to the trumpet. Oh. So, in the early days of materialization through Colin, it took 21 weeks from the moment he started to sit to get materialization. He sat for one hour a week. 21 hours it took to develop him. We were able to start capturing photographs through the cabinet to see them starting to partially materialize. So let's be logical, ladies and gentlemen. That looks like a nurse's glove. You know the rubber gloves? Coming from his ears. And this is why I say to you, photographs don't do it justice unless you are present. This is a hand that is formed from the cabinet. I noted on this one, the wrist is out of shape. It looks too big. And the spirit people used to say to us, when we materialize, sometimes we materialize without a leg or half our face. And that's why sometimes in the early days it's easier for us to stay in darkness because no one wants to see their child with half a face. So they would then just focus solely on the voice and materialize the hand so you can hold the hand of your child while the voice is talking to you. We were able to achieve hand molds and what we would do with this is we would get paraffin wax and the spirit people would materialize, put their hands into the wax, go back into cold water, backwards and forwards, and form a wax glove. We would then pour pasta Paris into it, we would then heat up the wax, and then we were able to then achieve a hand. We would all have to be fingerprinted if we were doing hand molds, so we would get the hand molds and they would be in different positions, we would then fingerprint everyone present in the room. We would send it off to the Noah's Ark Society along with the SPR, and they noted that all our fingerprints didn't match the one that came from Plaster of Paris. We were trying to do an experiment where we were going to see if the spirit people could bring someone who was arrested many years ago, had their fingerprints taken, who's now deceased, and see if we can get them to materialize, get the hand mold, get it sent off, and say, this is hand appears, this is wonderful proof of everlasting life. Unfortunately, we didn't achieve it. However, who knows what next week can bring. The thoughts out there. You know, Sonia said the Milligan experiment. Maybe we should change it, but we should challenge my spirit team for the Rinaldi experiment. <laughs> and then if we do that, we should have a we don't die experiment as well. <laughs> as long as the spirit people are in agreement. Okay? So you'll note that the hands, we would always have uh, nails, they have uh, all the markings inside. I said to Magnus one time, oh, wouldn't it be awesome that you try something else with the hand? And he said, I could do better than that. And he picked up the bowl of wax and poured it on his face. And then he got the cold water, washed his face, and then we had a perfect face of Magnus. It was given to Colin because of Colin's mediumship. Colin's died, we don't know where it's gone. So. I've said to the other world, wouldn't it be lovely to produce an apport, which is an object that appears in the air? I said, if I could put my order in, can I have the mask of Magnus, please? Along with the crown jewels, because I want to wear them just for two nights. <laughs> wouldn't that be interesting? Um, unfortunately, the other world said no. <laughs> but we'll still see. OK, so I think now what we'll do is start to move on into our history, if that's OK. And I'll try and make this as interesting as possible. Now, uh, this is a prime example of materializations, and these are the kind of materializations that we used to get through Colin. Now, I have to confess that Colin only used red light on a very rare occasion, and on one occasion, the red light was on, and we saw a baby's face pushed through the cabinet curtain, and it looked like it was on the end of a hose. The eyes were closed, and it was looking around at us, and all of a sudden, the eyes opened, they were black as midnight, and they blinked, and obviously, me being a fine specimen of a man, woo, like that, as you do, like this, and then the face would collapse. And I think this is why I drink. I truly do. Because 
at the end of most of the demonstrations, because they were the most extraordinary things, I would see, I would go home to the drinks cabinet and go, <laughs> and mum goes, you all right? I went, yeah. What have you just done? Nothing. <laughs> no. And then walk off. So that was the only real time I saw partial materialization in light. However, in darkness, they used to turn the luminous plaque over, which shone up in the air, and the spirit people used to walk over to it, and you would then see the spirit person there. They would normally be in robes, like you see here. They would have different facial features, different hair, it would move. And I used to say to the spirit people, why do you look like you're a teenager with a hood up? And the spirit world said quite easily, when we step into the ectoplasm, we have to think how we look. So you see this part of you. You don't see this part of you. So it's easier for us to put the hood up so we don't have to concentrate what the back of our head looks like. So you'll see us like this. But in, if you studied other people's mediumship, it was down to the molecular structure and the capability of the medium. Like Carmine Marabelli, they, he would materialize people. And you'll see the buttons on the garments as they used to walk around the room. But I'll come to him in a moment. Now, I can't pronounce this person. Bina Boa? Yeah. Bina, that's it. It sounds better in American, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the materialization here. Uh, this one is from Helen Duncan, who was an incredible physical medium, who is the last ever living person at that time to be trialed as a witch under the Witchcraft Act. Because they thought she was a witch, she spent time in Holloway Prison where she would sit there and Albert, her control, would materialize, walk through the door into the cell next door and say, I have your mother or your father here. He would dematerialize, the mother would then materialize and say, I raised you better to be a criminal and all of this. And there's wonderful accounts and stories at Holloway Prison that this woman who was able to bring the dead back to life. Sir Winston Churchill used to have sit-ins with Helen Duncan as well and to have guidance on the way forward. Now, if you do study Helen Duncan's work, there's a lot of photographs that look like paper mache and you see the woman blindfolded. These are replicated for her trial because at the Old Bailey, she said, I will demonstrate my gift for you. And everyone turned around and said no. If I was Helen... I would probably would have closed my eyes and said to the other world, I trust you, do what you need through me. However, she didn't. So we had to recreate the photographs, which were paper mache, the letters from Alan Crosley saying that Mrs. Duncan was denied the opportunity to demonstrate, so we had to recreate the photographs. Unfortunately, Wikipedia has got the photographs and said these are fake, quite rightly so, but the letter has gone astray, so therefore, they're saying that she was a fraud anyway. This is why we are still going to the Parliament as a spiritual national union to try and get her name annulled from the Witchcraft Act. It will happen, but it will take time. But this is quite common, what you would see in the demonstration. If the lights are off, you would only hear the voice and you hear the steps coming over to you. The hand will form. A lot of people think that the people who materialize, their hands are cold, they're not, they're warm. They're warm. But what was extraordinary for Colin, because he used to demonstrate in the lodge, which was a shed, in theory, in the height of summer would get too hot, Charlie Carter, the little spirit boy, will, will walk around with a bowl of water, and you're allowed to put your fingers in and just dab to cool yourself down. He said, do you want us to do something for you, mister? And I said, yes, please. He said, put your hand in, put my hand in. It was water. Took my hand away, do it again. As I put my hand in, the water had turned to ice. I said, can I have a martini with that, please? Because <laughs> I used to drink. <laughs> so, with the phenomena, yeah, I yeah, say the word used to. <laughs> I made a promise yesterday I won't drink again. <laughs> so, let me go on to a wonderful lady called Estelle Roberts. Have any of you heard of this lady before? If you just wave your hands at me. Estelle Roberts was the queen of mediumship. Now, Estelle Roberts was a clairaudient medium, so she was able to hear the information. She was a clairvoyant medium. She was able to see people as clear as you and I. She sold out the Royal Albert Hall. She demonstrated in a time when women's rights were not necessarily understood. 
If you were a female physical medium in those days, you would have to be stripped off naked and inspected by men. Yep. A, a cruel, humane way. Because what they used to do with Florence Cook was to strip her off naked, brush her hair out when they laid her down, and then hammer her hair into the floorboards so that she was unable to move, while the spirit people then materialized from her. But I'll talk about Florence Cook a little bit later. But with Estelle Roberts, that she would be standing there and they would check every orifice. They would make sure she had nothing concealed, the same with Helen Duncan. And then she was made to be dressed in front of everyone and then taken to her chair and then she would demonstrate. How far are you prepared to take your mediumship and how prepared are you to try and prove this to people who will not accept what we do? Darren will tell you, in my own work, at the Arthur Finley College, where I was demonstrating for a number of years, I had people put their hands down my trousers, go round my front and round my back, and without washing their hands, stick the same hand in my mouth. Aww. I would be asked to take my clothes off, and one person decided to pull down my trousers in front of 50 people. There is a bit of me which will rise to the bait, and there's other bits of me I'll say no. There was a time... Welcome, friend. Um, there was a time where I would be tied to a chair, and someone said, can I tie your jeans to the chair? So I said, yes, by all means. So they tied my jeans. And he said, can you move? Well, I went, not really. He said, good. And he got the cable tie, put it round my neck, tightened it, pulled my head back, and tied me to the chair like this. I looked to the person who was running the circle, thinking that they're going to intervene. They did not. I went into the trance state in a not a very good way, and my helper did the phenomena very aggressively, and within 15 minutes, he turned around and said, are you satisfied? And the person said, yes, and they said, good, now release him. They released me, I came out of the trance states, and people said, well, we're here for a seance. And I said, I can't make it work, I can't. If they've released the grip, I can't, it doesn't matter if I'm praying or whatever, I can't move back into it. And the spirit person said, we have to give power to convince one mind instead of allowing all of us to work to prove it all to you. So I say to all of you, your gift is precious. Be careful who you hand it to. But will you be prepared to go that extra distance to satisfy a skeptical mind? I now say, if you want to sit, please do. If you don't, thank you very much. Because I think at the end of the day, it's the, it's the it's the sanctity of it, the specialness of what we are taking place, what we are meeting our friends. But Estelle Roberts, going back to her, my little flower, but she used to demonstrate once a year on Christmas, and she would demonstrate in broad daylight, and she would sit there, and her control, Red Cloud, would materialize and walk out and greet everyone present. Maurice Barbonell, who was editor of the Psychic News, was allowed to touch Red Cloud's hair. And as he touched Red Cloud's hair, Red Cloud said, would you like a lock of my hair? So he said, yes, and they then cut a lock of the hair. And as they cut the lock of Red Cloud's hair, Estelle whimpered in the cabinet. And as she came out of the trance states, it was noted that there were spots of blood on her solar plexus, which showed whatever they took away from the form was connected to the medium. She would be in bed for a week after the demonstration because it used to take so much out of her. Leslie Flint, who is a fantastic communicator, independent direct voice man, he noted that when he sat with Estelle, his grandmother materialized and scared him half to death. And he made a promise to the spirit world and said, if you do this through me, I will give it up. He was happy to do the voice box, but he wasn't happy with the materialization. But another rare gift from Estelle was stigography. And stigography is where they would get, a ca you know, for Polaroid cameras, you know, you click it and the thing pops out. You get the film, expose the film in the seance, and then when the light comes on, you would then have a perfect picture, and this is of Red Cloud. And it's called stigography. Am I boring you yet? No. Because I'm going to try harder now. <laughs> Alec Harris. Uh, Again, 
Do any of you know of Alec Harris? There's a, there's a couple of waves, a couple of waves. He was a man from the Valleys. Valleys. He was a Welsh man. Um, he was a skeptic. His wife used to go to prayer class, and he wanted to know why his wife went to prayer class. So he said, I'm coming along. And his wife, Lou, said, well, no, I think it's better you just stay at home. He said, no, I'm coming along. <laughs> and he started to go along, and he realized something peculiar was happening to him, that he would close his eyes, and then phenomena would start. His control was called Rowan, which was an Arab man. And over time, he would actually start to materialize, but materialize in light. So you would see an Arab man walk out the cabinet. It was noted that Rowan was the same height as Alec. They thought it was Alec dressed up. Rowan would go back into the cabinet, and out came White Wing, which was the control of Louis his wife. Again, same height as the medium. Then, as White Wing would step back into the cabinet, out came Topsy, a little child. And then all three of them would walk out at once, would stand there, would part the curtains where you see Alec. And it was noted there was up to 48 materialized faces coming through all at once around Alec, and people were shouting out, that's my wife, that's my wife, that's my husband, that's my husband, that's my child, that's this, that's that, and that's this. And then the curtains were drawn. Rowan would disappear from the legs up, White Wing from the head down, and Topsy would go back into the cabinet and wave, and then draw the curtain. They would always make the children go back into the cabinet, then dematerialize, because, could you think, again, as a parent, having your child stand in front of you and then crumble like wax, that's going to be a horror film. So a loving memory would be them going back into the cabinet, maybe with a toy that a sitter had brought, or a piece of paper which they've written down stuff, and they'll blow a kiss and wave and draw the curtain. But it was noted that one time there was a demonstration with Alec, and Alec was sitting there, and a man came in with a, in a suit, uh, and Brendan, where are you? Is Brendan in here? Brandon? No. Um, I love Brandon because when he comes to a seance, he always dresses up in a suit or a shirt and tie because we were always taught when we go to see a seance, we dress our best because we don't know if we're going to meet our loved ones. And this man had dressed himself in his suit, and it was actually his wedding suit. He had flowers, which he put in a vase, and this man was getting really excited and loved one after loved one was coming out. And then eventually, this woman walked out. He screamed and said, oh, my darling. And he ran over to the vase, picked out the flowers, shook them dry, and go over to his wife and said, it's our anniversary. And he was able to hug his wife, kiss his wife, and talk to his wife. And his wife started to dissolve. And he started to go down to the floor with his wife. And all that was left was the head. And he goes, I love you, my darling. I love you, my darling. Gave her a kiss. And then she just evaporated into nothing. He got off the floor and he said, that was the best anniversary I've had. Thank you so, so much. And he went back to his seat. Alan Crosley would sit there next to Alec. And as the forms would come out, the curtain would part. And he was able to see Alec starting to disappear from the feet upwards. And he tried to get Lou's attention and say, Lou, Lou, your husband's disappearing. And he looked and there was an empty chair. But Rowan was still walking around the room. He said, Lou, your husband's disappeared. And she goes, oh, don't worry, he'll turn up. <laughs> Rowan turned around and said, go out the door. Go out to the front of your property. Open the door. You'll find your husband on the doorstep. Wake him up and bring him back in. <laughs> so they did. They opened up the door, and there he was, slumped in the thing, woke him up, and said, oh, how did I get out here? You need to come back in. He came back in. He went into the trance states, and the seance continued. There was one time this lovely man materialized and said, can I trouble you for a piece of paper and pencil? So he said, yes, of course. And he wrote a letter to his wife, folded it all up. He said, can I trouble you for some money for a stamp? So the sitter went, yeah, here you go. And off he went. He came back a few minutes later, said, thank you for that. Carried on talking, went, oh, I'm dreadfully sorry, I forgot your change. And he would disappear and then come back and go, there's your change. Wouldn't that, if you were the post lady, wouldn't you be like, <laughs> excuse me, sir, you look a, look a little bit pale. <laughs> but 
With Alec, he was so wonderful. He was so incredible. But two spiritualists wanted to say that he was fraudulent. So they went to a demonstration. They went to a demonstration and the spirit world said, darkness has crept in your seance room now. Rowan materialized and was very cautious standing in front of the medium and looking at everyone present. Louise said, come out and say hello to people. People have traveled far. And Rowan very gently started to shake their hands, but looking at people very, very differently. And then all of a sudden, someone jumped up and grabbed the form and bear hugged it and said, I've got him, I've got him. While the other one pulled out a camera, started to flash, and pulled down the blackout where there were people on the other side trying to take photographs. Louis stood up and said, you're killing my husband. Smacked this guy, and at this moment, the form disappeared. The person that was hugging the form realized then that this person is genuine, but they're starting to kill the medium. Alec was never the same since then. There was something wrong with his health. So Louis turned around and said, no longer will we conduct seances in light. So the next seance, the spirit person walked over and turned on the light, went, morning! <laughs> and she said, no, you're not doing that, turn out the light. So the spirit person went, oh, click, and then walked back into the cabinet. So she took out the bulbs, you know, the globes, took them out. The spirit people then walk out and start to glow themselves. And they said, we've worked too hard to creep back into darkness. And how he passed, he knew something was wrong. He woke up, he woke his wife up and said, I haven't got long. She said, I'll get the doctor. And he said, no, I, I, it won't work. He said, give me a kiss. And he ga- they kissed. And as they kissed, he died, kissing his wife. He passed to the world we call unseen. But this man, even though he was able to demonstrate in light, there's a book called The Mediumship of Alec Harris, written by his wife. I very strongly suggest you take a copy off Amazon or off wherever you can and read the extraordinary phenomena of Alec Harris. Jack Webber. Jack Webber was also uh, a miner. And if you look at him, this is a voice box. So this is what it looks like, lovely thing. It can sit on your shoulder. Um, It breathes, it moves, it can pull. So if it starts to move away from you, it feels like, you know your hairline at the back of your your neck here? It feels like when it goes to talk, it pulls on that. And I've noted that as it pulls, it feels like my front of my throat and back of the throat touch, and it makes me cough as it's happening. Now, Jack Webber is 33 years old when he died. That doesn't look like a 33-year-old, does it? He used to conduct three seances a day. The demand was so in need of his work, he would do these demonstrations. I struggle, I think at the height of it, at my absolute strength, I did four in two days, and it almost killed me. I couldn't work for over a month. So doing three a day, it weakened him so much And you could say to me, why would the spirit world do this? The spirit world will work us to death. They've already told us that, because there is no death. They said you have personal responsibility to look after yourself. We will look after you from the spirit world, but if you accept the conditions, we will work through you. And unfortunately, he contracted meningitis. His bone uh, density was of an 89-year-old. They noted when they were looking at his body, his body was too old for his age. They actually noted that it looked like he had cancer, which had gone all the way through him, but they couldn't find cancer. His nephew actually comes and sits with me, uh, and uh, Denzel. And on one occasion, that um, David Thompson was demonstrated in 2004 at the farewell seance in Banbury in Oxford. And... It was his last seance because he was moving to Australia. And William went round, shook the hands of everyone. And little Timothy Boo, the spirit child, came out. And Denzel noted and said, at the beginning of the year, uh, Timmy, you took my wedding ring. Can I have it back, please? I've searched the medium. I know he hasn't got anything concealed on it. And Timothy Boo apported the wedding ring. He said, but I could do one better than that. And then he apported another ring. And the another ring was a signet ring, which had the initials JW, which was confirmed that Jack Webber was buried in the earth with a signet ring on because he had broken his little finger. They couldn't get the signet ring off. 
they did say they will cut his finger off to remove the ring, and their family said no, which showed that Timothy Boo was a grave robber. <laughs> so he went to the grave and took it, which I think quite awesome. I said to the other world, why can't you go down to the Titanic and pull up a couple of pots? Because, we, you know, Sonia needs funding, you know. <laughs> it's a selfless act. Wouldn't it be lovely? Just bring that up for me. I'm still waiting. <laughs> Maybe we have to have a, a harder, harder path. Now, uh, Minnie Harrison um, was a lovely lady. Now, some of you may say, oh, I may be too old to do mediumship or too sick. She had cancer, and she was able to produce these wonderful forms. Now, when Aunt Ag would materialize, which noted there, um, she was always known to have cold feet. So as she would walk around the room, someone commented about her cold feet. So they said, could we feel your feet? So she lifted up the robe, and you saw her legs, and they touched her feet. And noted that the feet were cold. And then the robe went back down, and she carried on walking around the room. On another occasion, they said, do you still have cold feet? She went, oh, yes, my dear. And they said, well, can we feel them? She said, no, I haven't brought them, and lifted them up, and there was nothing underneath. <laughs> and it was noted that they were able to see the sitters on the other side of the room. And she said, look, I've got no feet. Pulled down the robe and carried on walking. Now, this is trumpet phenomena. This is what you would normally see with myself if the light came on. Now, in just before Boston, so this is just a month and a bit ago, I was demonstrating in a place in Scotland and the trumpet was up in the air, and the spirit people instructed for the music to be switched off. The lady couldn't find the, the switch of the music, so decided to turn the light on. And it was noted that the trumpet was about two and a half meters, or two to two and a half meters away. It was up in the air with a connecting cord very similar to this, but instead of it being in the end of the trumpet, it was held on the side here and it was up in the air. When the light came on, it ricocheted over to that side, fell to the ground, and whatever was attached to it sucked back into the cabinet. My face was burnt across underneath here. It felt like, you know when you get sunburn, and then you lay on the beach and you rub sand into your face? Oh. That's the exact way I can describe it. Underneath this eye was going black, and I noted uh, that the voice box is not as strong as it used to be, which shows there's been some kind of um, deceleration in the development at the moment, which we are working on in our home circle. So, you would, they noted to say that it looked like a, um, it looked like a, a hose um, shape, but it had like a lump on the side of it, which then moved round. It showed that the ectoplasm is still light like, sensitive and can recoil back, and I think I was incredibly lucky. Um, however, um, there was times where I had been burnt before, and uh, there may be a picture of one of the burns on here. I don't know. I don't know if we put it on here. Because I don't want to upset anyone because this is such a beautiful form of mediumship. But every coin has two sides to it. And this is why you would never poke a wasp nest with a, a, a stick, would you? You respect that environment. Carmine Marabelli um, was, again, an incredible physical medium. He was from uh, Brazil, funny enough. This is a dead person materializing from him. That's the medium. And he would go into trance within 24 seconds, and he would produce a materialization two seconds after that. So normally, he would be searched, and he would be strip searched, and he had to have his hands up. And as they are searching him, they put boxing gloves on his hands sometimes. And as they were searching him, his eyes would roll back into his head. As he would go back in the head, the spirit person would stand behind um, Carmine and said, are you ready yet? <laughs> Like this, and you will be noted to see this. He would do the demonstrations not only in the house, he would do them outside the house as well. This is a picture of him levitating. Um, they have said this is photoshopped. But going back 100 years, they didn't really have photoshopped to advance that we had it. They said he was standing on a ladder like this. Um, I think that's a load of poppycock. I think it's rubbish. Um, but you note on here, this is the door frame. Um, there's a window frame, and that's the door frame, and he would levitate. There was also known to him that he would levitate, and in the olden days, the building's ceilings were much more higher, um, especially the Victorian buildings. So they used to put charcoal in his hand. He would levitate up to the ceiling and start to do automatic writing on the ceiling in the handwriting of your loved one. Um, and then 
he would float back down. Same as Daniel, Daniel Douglas Hume or Daniel Douglas Home, depending on where you're from. It was noted that he used to levitate and go up to the ceiling. He also then levitated out the second floor window and then went round the building and came in through another window, which was seen in um, the streets and was used as a point of reference in the film called The Illusionist. Now, with um, Carmine Marabelli, he was such an incredible man, um, but we wanted to do a study because we started to realize that certain cultures are able to take light in seances. So people who are developing in Africa, uh, people who are developing in Brazil. And I don't know if it's a skin pigmentation, because if I stand out in the sun now without any block on, I will burn like a crisp. Um, and I'm very light sensitive, and I get sunstroke quite easy. So we were looking at possibly pin, uh, skin pigmentation. <coughs> However, Alec was from the valleys. You can't get cloudier and wetter than that. So, and he was able to take light. So we're now looking to see if it's something within our blood. Is there a plasma within our blood which allows us to work in such a way? Or is it just that it's an energy? Who knows? Am I still boring you? I think I am. <laughs> I probably am. I don't know. Maybe. Let's see. This is a dead person. Yay! <laughs> but he looks more alive than this one because he looks terrified. <laughs> it's Carmine with his eyes <laughs> rolled back. <laughs> And a lot of times in these seances, they used to just put a chair out, and as he sat there, the spirit person would just go, pop, pop up, hello. Yeah. And the hands were always crossed. So the hands were always the last things to form, and then they would open up, and then they would wave at people. Um, no, he's in trance. So he's, he's under the influence of the spirit. This is the scientist. He's a doctor, actually. And this is a dead person who's materialized. There, which I love because if you look, it shows the skin pigmentation on their hip that he clearly has a different colour to the skin. Um, there's a lovely photo, which I must update some of these photos, of him sitting there and he um, materialises a little African boy and he's got the little the knots and towel on his head and I think that's really, really beautiful and he's out in the garden. And I find it very, very beautiful. Now, Silver Bella, again, it just shows a materialized form. This took over 30, I believe it's 33 minutes, and there's 39 photographs of this seance which was taking place. Uh, the medium would be in the trance state, and then you would see the smoke. And this is what we'd normally used to see with Stuart Alexander. Um, Stuart Alexander would sit there, and there'll be a table in front, very similar to the round table there. And I know a couple of you, I know. Sandra, you've sat. Has any else one sat with Stuart Alexander? Oh, you have as well. You know, the round table, did they show the hand? Yes. They, when they show the hand, so what happens is that Stuart is tied to a chair. There's a person that sits next to him was able to place his hand on top of Stuart, and then on, the other person places their hand on the other hand. And then out his stomach curl rolls this like mist, which you see there. And then all of a sudden, the hand will form and will knock on the table or drag the hand back. On the occasion there, Darren and I were able to sit next to him, and the hand came out and took my hand back to his stomach, and you felt the hand go back into the stomach. And then you felt the fingers push underneath his clothing back out. And as it formed, it formed with hair, and it was a gorilla's hand. Oh. I have to say, there was a little bit of apprehension. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't scream that time. I went, oh, are you seeing this as well? Yes. Oh, how marvelous. <laughs> Can we have a beer afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> but with Stuart, Stuart's now retired. He only does it on a very rare occasion, which is very, very sad because he is an, a wonderful instrument of the spirit world. But he's now aging. He has health problems. And... I feel now that for him to do it on a rare occasion is probably very wise for his health. Um, he noted, he said, it's a young person's game. And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> I feel old and I feel tired. Um, now, this wonderful man, I hopefully you know who he is. Do you want to shout out his name? Gordon. Yay! Ding, ding, ding. 
Um, now, Gordon Higginson, um, he was an incredible medium. Now, wave at me if you don't know of Gordon. Perfect. Okay, so hopefully you'll know now. Um, so Gordon Higginson um, was the honorary president of the Spiritual National Union. He saved the Arthur Finley College through his work. Now, before he was born, his mother, Fanny Higginson, decided to go to a demonstration. And he le she left her mother at home. So she went to Lonton Spiritualist Church, which was just a few minutes down the road. And as she went in there, the medium was demonstrating. The medium turned around and said, I have your mother here. And she said, that's impossible. My mother is at home. And she said, you're going to have a child, and your name is going to be connected to this church for over 100 years. Since you've been here, since you left your mother, your mother has sat in the chair and was actually passed to the spirit world. You'll go home and find her in the chair. So she ran out of the room, obviously ran home to find, yes, her mother had passed. She had a number of children, then all of a sudden Gordon would come along. Gordon was noted to be a strange boy by his father, but at the age of four he would pick up a ball and throw it and it would stop and then fly back to him when he used to play catch with his control, Cuckoo, which was a small child. And every night he used to say, come on, Cuckoo, get into bed with me. Now, Fanny Higginson was a, a formidable medium, a very strict medium, because she used to make her son sit in the center of the circle and now say work at the age of four or five. He'd say, mother, I, I can see the spirit people. So she used to blindfold him. Mother, I can hear the spirit world. So she used to deafen him so that she, he, he would only rely on his senses. He would never question the spirit world. He sold out the Royal Albert Hall. This young boy was known as the messenger of God. His control was called Paddy, Choo Chow, Light, and Cuckoo. They all had different relevant roles. Chu Chow would bring philosophy, Paddy would bring the evidence, Cuckoo would bring the humor, but if you said no to Paddy, Cuckoo would then go through your bag and say, why are you hiding this bill? <laughs> Pull it out. Or she would run to your house and go through your drawers and find information and say, I've gone to your door in Sacramento and you're hiding the bills under the sofa. And you go, yes, that's right. And then Paddy will go, do you follow me now? <laughs> oh, yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and then lights would then predict for the year ahead. Now, with Gordon, he would demonstrate, and he was demonstrating at the Arthur Finn College, and there's a lovely lady called Kitty Wood. And Kitty Wood is a, a very wonderful medium from the Netherlands. And she was sitting on the floor, and Gordon said, I'm, I feel moved by the spirit world to do a seance. And in the library, they sat there, and exoplasm poured from his mouth, rolled on the floor like you see here now, and it would roll up to three meters away from him. As it would roll, one hand would come out one side, one hand would come out the other side, and it would crawl along the floor. When it got to three meters, the column would grow, and the hands would remain by the feet, and then all of a sudden the hands would then lift where they should be, the form would turn, and then pull back the blanket, and there will be your mother, there will be your father, and... Kitty said that as this blanket was pulled back, you heard this woman scream and said, oh my God, it's you, mum, it's you, mum. And the mum went over and hugged and kissed and spoke about many things. Gordon was doing another demonstration and it was noted that this man started to walk out of the cabinet and he was limping like this. They noted that he had braces on, but the braces were open, so they were down by the side. This woman screamed, said, you, you made my life hell, go away. And this poor boy is going like this over to his wife. No, you made my life hell. I've been happier since you've been gone, go away. So this poor boy just turned around and walked back into the cabinet. And they said, why are you doing this? She goes, I sent him with the stamp money to go and get the food for the rest of the week. He decided to go to the pub instead, got drunk. We went without food. And he had a wooden leg. So when he passed out, I took off a wooden leg, threw it in the fire, burnt it. When he woke up, he said, the money's in the, in the leg. Where's the leg? And she never forgave him for that. So when he came out, he was doing this. 
And I find that funny. I find that hysterical. Because we were doing a demonstration once. Oh, where's Darren gone? Um, Darren will tell you that we were doing a demonstration and I woke up and a voice was here went, Mother, mother in law. I said, Oh, there's a mother, mother in law? Lisa, it's your mother in law. I said, Oh, is, it, is there a Lisa here? And is your mother in law in the other world? And you heard this woman go, Yes, yes, I'm Lisa, and my mother in law is in there. And the voice came around and said, Yes, that's her, that's her, that's her. And they started to talk. And you think, OK, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, Okay, lovely. So this is nice information coming. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then all of a sudden, the voice says, I've got to go. So Lisa Livin said, before you go, I've always wanted to say something to you, and I couldn't get the opportunity to do so. So the mother-in-law said, yes, what's that? She turned around. Lisa said, I didn't like you, but she used the word, I effing hated you. So I've sat there going, <laughs> But then the voice came back and said, don't worry, my dear, I used to spit in your tea. So I was like, <laughs> and I thought, good for you, good for you, because you can't control who's going to come through. But Lisa shouted, even in death, this bloody woman had the last word. <laughs> and it just showed that they had their personality. And that's why with Sonia Rinaldi, when she had that voice came out, said, mummy, I can talk. Yeah. I tell you what, it took a lot not to cry then because it was the personality, it was the warmth behind it. And the voices come out with the warmth. Now, with Gordon, if you want to hear his seances, if you go onto Gordon Higginson Remembrance on the internet, you can hear his lectures, you can hear his trance stems, you can hear his public demonstrations, but also you'll hear this seance when they're taking the photograph. It was recorded by Eric Montague Williams, and he describes that Gordon, the night before, they tried to capture the materialization from him on camera, and he's received third degree burns. Aww. And you hear Paddy saying, the medium's very sore. That's my Irish accent, really badly. Um, <laughs> however, that Gordon was incredible. And through his gift, through his mediumistic awareness, that the JV Trust, the Wanless's family, Roy and Christine Wanless, had three of their children pass. Through his mediumship, all three of them walked out the cabinet as well as other bits of information. Now, the Wanlesses were multi-millionaires. They said to Gordon, you have changed my life. What do you need? And anything was going wrong with the Arthur Finley College, because it was in, in years ago, they didn't have electricity, so you used to have to use your lighter to go around the college. You think it's scary now with the lights on. Think when the lights were off. <laughs> the ceiling was see, uh, sinking in because they needed a new roof. So Gordon said, I need this. And they would sign a check. The check would arrive the next day. Gordon never took real payment for his work. He would go to the churches and he would demonstrate. And Eric Hatton said, Gordon, have you been paid? And he goes, isn't that a lovely wallpaper you've got? Gordon, did they pay you? Oh, I wonder what's for dinner. Gordon, did they pay you? Oh, I wonder if I should get the card tomorrow. And he would do every excuse. So Eric used to phone the church and say, pay the man. When Gordon died, they went to his writing desk and opened it up, and he had every check that the church had paid for. He never cashed them. He died as a pauper. His money was dried up. He is an incredible example of people who have had extraordinary gifts. In the Lake District, he used to go on holiday with Glyn Edwards. Glyn Edwards was a hysterical man. So who's, who met Glyn Edwards here? OK, at the back. Um, he would, would this be the right thing? Oh, my boy! He used to come onto the platform, and he would throw his um, poncho down, and he would go, I have a man here. And he tells me this, and he would be so dramatic, and I loved him for it. Uh, but he was an outstanding medium. And when they rested in the Lake District, they got out at a car park, and it had a jetty out, which it was out to sea. And there was a man and woman walking. And Glenn goes, isn't it lovely here? And he said, Gordon, what are you doing? He said, you're tuning in, aren't you? He said, oh, yes, they've just got married. They're staying at this hotel. They've never been here before. They're staying in this room, 129 or 128. Their parents have paid for it. And Glyn goes, no, that can't be right. He said, well, come on then, let's find out then. 
And he woke up to me and goes, oh, hello. And they turned around and said, oh, hello. He said, isn't it lovely here? Have you been here before? Oh, no, it's our first time. Really? <laughs> what brings you here? We've just got married. Oh, really? <laughs> if that's the case, you should stay at this hotel. Oh, that's the room, you know, have the hotel we're staying in. He goes, oh, really? I hear they've got beautiful rooms. It's quite expensive. Oh, our parents paid for it. Oh, really? <laughs> he said, there's a room, 128, 129. That's a specifically beautiful view. Oh, that's our room. Oh, really? He would go. He'd say, oh, have a lovely life. And he'd walk off and say, see? <laughs> And he did that without going to the spirit world. He literally went in with the psychic. But Gordon was doing, um, it was at the Arthur College, and they were doing a raffle, like the raffle you see here. But the star prize was like a perfume set. And Betty Waitlin was going up and down. He said, for Christ's sake, Betty, what's wrong with you? Oh, I really want to win. I really want to win. What do you want to win? She said that. He went, oh, for Christ's sake, what's your number? And they was, she said, oh, it's like one, I'm using 126 as an example. It's 126. And he went, out of all those tickets, he went, there. There you go. And it was 126. And they said, Gordon, how did you do it? He said, I asked Cuckoo to find the ticket. Go to the left, <laughs> go to the right, there, there, there. You would never win with Gordon, because he would, in Scrabble, because he would psychometrize the letters. So he would pull out the letters that he needed. Cuckoo <laughs> would then whisper to him what the person opposite has got. <laughs> When they were playing cards, he would say, you might as well throw away that ace, you won't win. <laughs> and he said, Gordon, how do you know? He said, Cuckoo told me. <laughs> Again with Betty Waitlin. Betty Waitlin used to like to test Gordon. So she would dress up and go to a demonstration, but she used to enter the room after he'd gone into trance states. And he would stand up and he'd walk around the room with his eyes closed without tripping over anything and be in the trance states, and Chu Chao would speak through him. And then all of a sudden, Chu Chao would then pull back, and Paddy would be there. He said, you can't fall us, dear, at the back with your beard. And she'd go, for Christ's sake, Paddy, how did you know? He said, we know everything. And one time that Gordon phoned Betty, and Betty picked up the phone, and she just got out of the shower, so she's just starting to get dressed, so she was in her bra and undies. And she's talking away, and she said, Gordon goes, for Christ's sake, when I phone, please make sure you put a robe on. <laughs> she said, it's nothing secret with you, Gordon. He said, no. Cuckoo's just told me I've ended this conversation now. <laughs> and put down the phone. Now, another occasion, I like this man is truly, truly, we owe hit this man a lot. Truly, truly a lot. Uh, he was selfish. He'd passed in 1993. He couldn't hold on for a couple more years so I could shake his hand. I've shaken his hand and spoken to him in the seances, but unfortunately, he was selfish and he died. <laughs> yeah, he died. He was dispatched. Um, but Gordon was so uniquely funny and wonderful. Uh, he had a wonderful sense of humor. He used to love Mills and Boone books. And um, they were like classical romance novels. And on one occasion, they were at the Arthur Finley College in January, they would have volunteers to come and help clean it. And Eileen Davies, who is a, an extraordinary medium, we're hopefully bringing her to the United States because she is incredible. And um, Eileen was asked to help cook. And again, Betty Waitlin was there. And she was cooking away. And they were making meat pies. So they made these meat pies, put them in the oven, served them to Gordon, Gordon goes, oh, lovely, and started eating them. And they said, right, now we need to feed the dogs. Where's the dog meat? <laughs> and Betty goes, don't you dare, don't you dare say. <laughs> she opens up the and she goes, I did, I've just fed dog meat to him. <laughs> she said, don't you dare say anything. The spirit people told them. <laughs> but Gordon... Incredible idiom. He had every gift of the spirit besides automatic writing. Every gift of the spirit. The Bang sisters, May and Lily Bang, from America. Uh, Lily Dale has a lot of their work. They used to do materialization with precipitated art. And this is one of their examples. This was produced within 27 minutes, and not a single hand touched the canvas. There were no paints in the room. 
and it would appear. Not only would they do your controls, they will actually do loved ones as well. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't got someone of that talent at the moment to do precipitated art, but if you go and see uh, Jose Madrado, or Jose, um, who's from uh, Sao Paulo, near Sonia, and Sonia uh, has met him, uh, lovely man, he's so funny, um, he produces art uh, because he owns an orphanage in Brazil, and they said, we're going to turn uh, paint into bread. And the money that's raised from his paintings get auctioned off, and it feeds all the people in the orphanage. Uh, Jose Madrado, uh, lovely man, but he was able to produce a smell called ether. So as he sits there and talks to you, he says, the doctor's here, and the whole room will smell of ether. And when I met this man, um, I was a little bit skeptical, because I was told people in Brazil get taught to paint very, very quickly. So um, I went along there, and I, I thought, well, he paints vases of flowers as Renoir. And, and we have Van Gogh and all the masters that work through him. And he produces paintings within two to three minutes. Very, very fast man. And normally his eyes are either closed or rolled back in the head. And now, occasionally, his eyes are open. And you can see him painting very quickly on YouTube. And so I created this vase of flowers out of several different vases which were in the room. And I said to the spirit people, if this man is genuine, please paint one of the vases that I have touched. As he came into the room, he doesn't speak English very well. And he started to work. And he's gone into the altar states. And Renoir started to paint through him. And as he's painting, he looked at the vase looked back, looked at the vase, and he looked at me, and his eyes were rolled to the back of his head, and he, went, and he carried on painting. <laughs> and he had painted the vase that I was holding while I asked the spirit world, which gave me confidence that this man is motivated by the power. But what was more extraordinary, out of 100 people, he said, the doctor's here, and everyone started to smell the ether besides four of us. And he said, through the interpreter of Solange, said, who here cannot smell the ether? And four of us put our hands up, me being included. And he opened up a piece of paper, and it had the number four on there. He said, now watch. And as he put his hands up, all four of us went, Dah! oh my god, that's so strong. And it smelled like board marker, you know, the white board marker. That really, really strong. He said, unfortunately, you, you four are going to be ill. And the doctor has said, we have to work on you separately. I said, I'm fine. The next day, I was taken to hospital because they thought I had um, ammonia. <laughs> uh, but the doctor said that he had to intervene now before it would go any further. Um, and I thought that was very interesting. But moving swiftly on, uh, Marjorie Crandon or Nina Crandon. And uh, let me note that there's a hand materializing from her. Um, yeah, could you imagine shaking that hand? Um, <laughs> Now, Stuart Alexander, Stuart Alexander, so this is what we kind of saw with Stuart, but instead of the hand coming from that area, it came from his stomach. So the hand is making of the wax, so there's the, the, the bowl of water, that's the wax, so it's starting to go in there and making the hand. Now, Walter Stinson, who was the brother of Marjorie, passed away, and he's now working through her, and this is the hand of Walter Stinson, the same hand that materializes with Stuart Alexander. Marjorie's husband is co called Dr. Leroy Crandon, who developed Marjorie, but Harry Houdini tried to destroy her every step of the way. Just before we got here, Dr. Leroy Crandon came through in the voice box to wish us all well for the event. We were trying to get the recording to play it because you didn't know about it. I'm not supposed to know, but unfortunately, loose lips sink ships. Someone brought it up in conversation. I was like, ah. So the other world truly know that we are here. Now, as I said to you, this is a hand that forms. Uh, this is an early stage of a materialization through Eva C. and also through Marjorie Crandon. As you note, uh, it looks like a cardboard cutout. It would come out the gland system, then start to inflate, and then step away from the medium. There was a wonderful medium called Keith Milton Reinhardt, who um, used to materialize spirit people in light. He is the only one we know of who has had his seance recorded by video. Uh, it's a very rare recording. It's in Japan. Um, the Philosophical Society, which uh, Keith Milton Reinhardt was a part of, 
used to release the photos of the gems coming from his eyes and from his mouth and the materializations from there. It was taken quickly off of the internet and we're trying to get a copy of it because it'd be awesome to show. However, it's part of someone else's work. Uh, Keith Milton Reinhardt uh, used to materialize what was known as the true Ascended Masters, not through Madame Belaski, but through his own work. And they would materialize and walk away from him. The video shows him sitting in a chair like this, and it looks like cigarette smoke pouring around his stomach. A hand pops out, another hand pops out, and out comes the head, and he steps out of Keith Milton Reinhardt which I have to say, I was like, can you rewind that, please? <laughs> and it was just so extraordinary. And I said, oh my God, this has proven that the spirit world can. But unfortunately, why aren't we getting the same results that we did so many years ago? And I think that's because our world has become too busy. We've got terrible distractions because once you leave this room, a lot of you will check your emails. A lot of you will check Facebook or Facebooky and things like that. In the olden days, they used to just sit and create their own entertainment, their own power. Leslie Flint. Now, I have to say I'm a Leslie Flint groupie. <laughs> Leslie Flint. Uh, his book is Voices in the Dark. Um, this was his original seance trumpet. Um, it was given by him to John Austin. John Austin gave it to Colin. Colin gave it back to John. John gave it to me. So it finds its owner. That's why I've got to take it to every talk, every demonstration, because I don't know how it's going to find its owner. Could you imagine it starts to fly away? I'll be like... <coughs> <laughs> I'll be like, there is no death. <laughs> That's why it's all beaten, because it's hand marks. I'm like... <laughs> bring it back. Um, so it has to come back. Now, when he, in the early days that he used to slip into the trance states and he used to have materialization, but he got wind of it and he said, if you start materializing from me, I will give it up. A very good friend of ours, Carol Hawkins, used to live with Leslie Flint. I said to him, what was Leslie like? Because he, he again, selfishly died in 1994. Selfishly. Couldn't hold on for a couple of years. Uh, again, spoken to him on many, numerous occasions through the seances. And she said, we would sit there, and he'd be smoking like a trooper. He would have a gin and tonic in one hand, a cigarette in another. And he'd be laughing away. And then all of a sudden, from the chandelier, a hand will form and start to wave at everyone. And he can say, Mickey, pack that up. Stop that now, Mickey, pack that up. And the hand would disappear. And then it would come through the coffee table and start waving. <laughs> and he said, I think they want to talk to us. Put out your cigarettes. So you put out your cigarettes. You carry on drinking your gin and tonic, and out came the voices. If you want to hear Leslie, if you go on to Leslie Flint Trust, you'll have uh, opportunities to listen to his downloads. Now, a lot of them are celebrities. However, we kind of challenged the spirit world and said, what's the purpose of you bringing through celebrities when you can bring through a loved one? They said the loved one takes a lot more power to bring them through. So Leslie would do a sit-in, and say 11 or 12 loved ones would come through. But then they will bring a guest speaker, which will be known to everyone. So if he was doing a demonstration in Colorado, and there was over 200 people present, not everyone's going to get a message, are they? So they will bring through as many loved ones as possible, and then they'll bring through Bapu, who was Mahatma Gandhi, or they'll bring through someone else, which everyone can take something from. But you would hear Leslie, he would be sitting there, and you can hear him sucking a sweet, going, oh, my. He goes, come along, Mickey. Come along, Mickey. And the voice would say, I'm here, mate. And he said, do you want us to sing? And the voice would go, oh, no, mate. You would hear him sneezing or coughing, and you hear Mickey saying, oh, shut up, will you? And he said, I can't help it. I've got Qatar. He said, well, blow your nose, then. And you'd hear him having conversations. They used to make him hold dye in his mouth. So ink dye put it in his mouth, seal his mouth up, stitch his fingers to the chair, and then all of a sudden, these voices would come out. After uh, X amount of time of 15 minutes, eight audible voices were heard. They would then unstitch Leslie, and he would take up the thing, and he will spit into a measuring jug the water, which was dyed, which showed he didn't swallow or regurge. So it showed that it wasn't coming from his own vocal cords. They used to stick microphones here, 
and not a single sound would come from his own vocal cords. The voices were always heard around him. That's why they were called Voices in the Dark. But Leslie was so funny, so wonderful. Whenever he uh, comes through, he'll say, have you been a naughty boy? <laughs> <laughs> or he used to say, do you have any scandal? And you would tell him, he goes, I used to love sitting there and hear all the scandal through the voices. It was wonderful. Okay. But what a wonderful man, and we owe him a lot. He lived in uh, 140 Westbourne Terrace in London, and then moved to Princes Street in Hove. So where I lived is in Burgess Hill. Five minutes up was Colin Fry. Two doors down from Colin was David Thompson. So I had two physical mediums, two doors apart. If you then went south of Hayward Teeth, 20 minutes, I had John Austin, who was an independent direct voice medium, but gave it up to develop Colin. You had four streets down from that, you had Leslie Flint. 25 minutes north of that, you had Joan Averson, who was sitting here, who was an independent direct voice medium. About 13 minutes east of that, you had Polly, who was a materialization medium. We had a cluster of people all in one group. Um, this is Bram, um, which was Leslie's partner. Um, when we are mediums, our partners kind of get lost in the mix. People gravitate to the medium and kind of forget about the partner. And that's what they used to do with Leslie. They used to push Bram to one side. And they go, oh, Mr. Flint, I would love a sitting with you. And he said, oh, that's funny. You need to talk to him. And then Bram would go, oh, I'm popular now, am I? <laughs> but Bram would always look after Leslie. You need someone who will look after him. Because as mediums, we have a soft heart. And it's very hard for us to deny when someone says, oh, do a, sit, you know, do a seance. You'll be like, all right, then. But then you need someone who says, no. No, he's not doing a seance because I'm looking out for him. I love this picture if it's um, the one I'm thinking of. Uh, this is Leslie walking away towards uh, Rudolf Valentino's grave because he was a, a Valentino fan. And he used to do a Valentino nights where Rudolf Valentino would just come through the voice box and talk to him. Now, Leslie was banned from the theatre because he would sit there and they'd turn down the lights and the voices would come out. <laughs> They used to say, shh, and he goes, it's not me. Mom, 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 no, da, dad, da. And the voices would come out. And it was noted, it was noted that when they were driving home one time, and obviously street lights aren't as bright as they are today, they were driving home and the voices would come out in the car. And Bram said, for God's sake, Leslie, don't you have a moment's peace? And the voices go, we need to tell you something. And Leslie goes, all right then, can I pop a sweet in? And he would pop a sweet in and out came the voices and Bram would carry on his journey home. Um, OK, so this is the awkward part, because this is now talking a little bit about our development, if that's OK. So um, many years ago, I was uh, asked to do 11 test seances for the Arthur Finley College to see if I was uh, up to a standard to work there. I went through 11 test seances, and I passed every single one, including that they wanted a lot of phenomena in the red light. But it was noted that if we did do red light sit-ins, we had no loved ones coming through. Um, I will show you some examples of the ectoplasm that we had. I have had some devastating news that I handed out uh, the day before I came here about my laptop, who has got one recording of part of my seance. The laptop made a funny noise and started to smoke from the side. And I sent you a voice message in distress, going, ah! <laughs> as you do. But there may be an opportunity that we can take the innards out and put it in something else, because it's also got photos of my father on there, which we haven't backed up. So I've kind of left the laptop on a tray, and I put, don't touch me, I'm dead, because <laughs> I'm quite dramatic. Um, so. A few years ago, we uh, were doing these test seances, and someone said we would like to get a hand mold. So I said, OK, let's see what we can do. And we had, I have two spirit children that work with me, one being Daniel, and the other one's known as Sarah. Before we knew Sarah's name, she was known as Princess. But Daniel would call her Scruff Bag, Scruffy, <laughs> It. He would refer to her as something. And they had the love-hate relationship. It's really funny. Um, and on a number of occasions, we used to work with either two or four 
seance trumpets which glowed in the dark. And one trumpet would go up this way, one trumpet would go up that way. I would then uh, uh, be awake, and I would say, right, Daniel, who's who? Daniel, and the trumpet would do this. I said, princess, and it would do that. And I said, oh, princess, you're winning. And then Daniel will go, bang, with his trumpet. And then she'll come back and fight back. And then you'll see these trumpets go, boom, 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 around. And I had to be parent, and I'd say, stop it. And they would stop, and then they would turn. And I would hear in my head, get him. And they would come in and start hitting me. And then I'll be like, no, 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 stop it, stop it, stop it. And um, I notice that if I think really loud, it pushes the trumpet away, which now shows that the spirit world can use, move the trumpet. I can move the trumpet now. So when they turn, I'm like, and I'm pushing the trumpet away. It's coming up like this. It's like a horror film, isn't it? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they knock me out, and then they hit me, and then wake me back up. <laughs> and that's why my hair's always, like, all over the place. So um, we said, OK, Daniel, can you do a hand mold? Uh, he couldn't do it, so the little girl did a perfect hand mold out of clay, pressed into it, and it was then placed on Tanya, who's the general manager's desk at the AFC, and it was drying. I leave the off Finley College. I come back to it about a week later. I said, can I have the hand mold? Because we were on about putting it in the museum at the Arthur Finley College. And we were like, where is it? And we found out that the assistant, Viv, thought it was just something which was left over, so she threw it in the bin. I have to say, if someone had the camera, it would have been so funny because there's me and Tanya doing dumpster diving in the bins, going like this, ripping through the bags, unrealizing unre that this bin had already been emptied. So we lost it. So we went and got another one, but we were using like a Play-Doh memory foam um, substance. So when you press it in there, it will hold its shape, and then after time, it loses its shape. And that's why the hand's not as clear as we, what we would like. We are starting to work a little bit stronger on that. Now, let me just introduce you to the boys. Um, Daniel, this is done through a psychic artist called Debbie Dean in the United Kingdom in 2008. We were predicted that he was going to try and do the picture. Um, she would close her eyes and she would hold the pencil. Instead of it being like this, she would turn her hand like that and draw. And within a minute and a bit, produce this picture. This is Morning Star. This is the love of my life from the other world. He comes um, now on a very rare occasion. His brother is called Archman Little Wolf, and he uh, prophesizes. So he will say, the buffalo will stamp and the ground will shake. An hour to two hours later, we'll have an earthquake. It would be a significant one. Um, we, they predicted it, and then Christchurch in New Zealand had the horrific one. They predicted the blood of the land will rise and will burn through the forest. And then about four hours later, a volcano will go off. So we call him doom and gloom. So <laughs> when he comes, it's like doom and gloom. Marvelous. Um, no, I don't mean that. But it is what it is. The reason I'm showing you these pictures is before I never released any of my work. I never released any of my photographs or anything like that. There was a wonderful man called Bill Wright in Scotland. And he does psychic art, but through a different way. He uses wood. And he produced this. Now, there's another little twist to this one. Daniel is seven and a bit and a little bit more. And we said to him about his life, and we found out a secret about him. He isn't seven and a bit and a little bit more. He's actually 54 years old. He doesn't like to be 54 because that was not a happy time of his life. He says that when the seance is conducted, not everyone's been 54, so you won't, we won't have empathy with one another. But everyone's been seven and a bit and a little bit more. So he changes his appearance to it. He used to like a drink. Now, what happened was he, he, he drank a lot. He was a bit drunk. He came out the pub. He slipped and banged his head. And as he laid there, people thought he was drunk, so they just stepped over him. Actually, he was dying. And he described his death to me. He said, I laid there, I saw stars. And he said, and all of a sudden, I felt tired. I felt no pain. I felt no pain from the moment I fell. I looked there, and I couldn't see time anymore. And then all of a sudden, I closed my eyes, and there was my mother standing there. And she, he said, that's a bit strange, because she's been dead. And she said to him, Daniel. And he turned around and said, what are you doing here? You're dead. 
And his mother returned and said, so are you. <laughs> now get up and meet your father. And he said, that was a shock, because the person I thought who was my father wasn't my father. And he told his life that way. He said, but I want to help in this world. And he said, I didn't live a happy life, but I want to make sure that other people now live a happy life. And I really, uh, truly, truly love his personality. Uh, he's a cheeky little thing. Um, when I hear him in my head and when we interact, the way we interact is to go, oh, I'm all, are you, you're right, fella. He goes, yeah, I'm all right, mate. How are you? And I said, yeah, I'm not too bad. It's been a tough one today. He goes, well, try dying. That's tough. <laughs> you're like, OK. Um, and when I see him, his teeth are all buckled. So when his teeth are buckled, I say to him, your teeth are looking like they're having a party. It looks like you brushed your teeth with a stick of dynamite. You know? And he said, when I look at you, all I see is a forehead with teeth because I'm starting to recede. So that's how we talk to each other. So when that was produced and everyone said, that's not him, I said, no, actually, that's really accurate, but he's got sticky out ears and his teeth look like they're having a party. I have a bit of OCD with broken things. So this trumpet here is really hard for me because I would normally throw it away. And the wood started to split and he has two split marks on the side of his head. So I said, sorry, Dan, you're going in the bin, I'm afraid. And now, when he appears, he has two big scars down here oh. to match his carving. Oh. And he said, everyone loves a scar. <laughs> so, like, so that's why I like him, because he's quick. He's quick off the mark. Um, John Austin, circle leader. I'm going to speed through now. Circle leader. Um, we get our ports. And when they take objects away, it's called an asport. When they bring objects, it's an apport. We started getting a lot of coins, and the coins which were given out would have significant dates on them. So we had a guy that came over from America who had a partner. So he was born in 1980. His partner was born in 82. And the coin from his father said, this will bridge your gap. And the coin date was 1981. So it has to have relevance. So every airport must have meaning. It can't just be a crystal. It can't be this. It has to be a solid, proven meaning. So we started to get all these. It was like a human fruit machine, just all these random things dropping. And this is why you get asked to check your jewelry before a sitting, because we had a 24-karat gold cross and chain apported, and it fell on the floor. When the light came on, they said, oh, that's mine. I was wearing it when it came in. I was like, well, really? <laughs> she said, oh, yes, it's mine. And she could barely stand up. <laughs> So because of that, unfortunately, you get a, a law put in to keep me safe. So these are just some of the apports. A communicator came through who was a mother, and uh, the mother had uh, brain cancer. And the daughter was supposed to go off to Egypt, but because she was ill, the trip was cancelled. So the communicator started giving out the information. Two people could accept it, but a lady called Lorraine won. And so they said, we want to apport this for you. Apported it. And then Daniel turned around and said, well, I can't leave you out. Bang, there was another one, which was this one. So two of them dropped at once. And please don't think this is ego. I'm just letting you know about what we have done. Because people say, well, why haven't you been tested? I've been tested beyond belief. And I just want to show you the bits that we've achieved. Uh, another lady called Elaine got communication from her father. George Formby came and sang, I'm leaning on the lamppost in the corner of the street. Then a voice shouted out, Lampy, Lampy, it's your father, and I want to bring you something. And they apported this object, which was bigger than a Pepsi can. It dropped on the floor. The lady, when the light came up, said, my father used to collect things like this, but I can't guarantee this is the same thing that we used to have when we were younger. Kitty Wood, um, just before I was um, tied to the chair, so I'm searched as normal, uh, magnetically wanded, the room is searched as well, tied to the chair. As I'm being tied to the chair, Kitty said, I've never seen an airport in red light before. She got communication from her grandfather because it was her birthday. And they invited her up again at the Arthur Finney College in the library in front of around 50 people. The light was put on, my mouth opened, and they only can describe as a flick of light, and out came this bracelet from my mouth. It was ice cold when it landed. What was more extraordinary was that at the end of the seance, when the light was up so we can fully see it, 
Eileen Davies left the room, ran up to her room, came down and said, I've got this for you. And it was wrapped up. She unwrapped it, and it was the pendant what matched the bracelet. Oh. So if you ever get to see Kitty, you'll see her permanently got this bracelet on, and she'll tell you the story. A man from Canada, um, he was a police officer. He drew his gun out and shot a man. We were running late to a demonstration at the Banyan retreat. I phoned ahead and said, just get everyone in the seance room. I'll literally walk in, tie to, me to a chair, and I'll start. So all the jewelry was taken off. He was a film extra from Cocoon. He did turn around and said, the spirit world can't love me because I've taken someone's life. Therefore, it's an ultimate sin. They produced this apport and said, we still love you, and dropped it in front of him. His wife left the room very quickly after the light came on and got her pendant. And it's not a clear picture because the camera phones were rubbish. Uh, it's a bare head with three feathers with a turquoise stone. A year to two years beforehand, they were getting married. Instead of having wedding rings, they decided to get pendants. She found this pendant in America, but they wanted the male version of it. They couldn't find it, but the spirit world found it. This was even more extraordinary. The uh, wonderful um, minister Eric Hatton had a wife called Heather Hatton who died and her code was butterfly. Eileen Davis was sitting next to the cabinet and they uh, produced an apport and they gave us instructions that we needed to go to Starbridge Church, which is a place that we've never been before. We had to go to this place and knock on the door and we will be met by Eric Hatton. So we traveled this great distance near Wales, never been, and we were met by Sue Farrow, editor of Psychic News, and Eric Hatton was there. I said, before you, we come in, if I show you this, do you recognize it? Showed him this, and he said, yes, that belonged to my wife. It should be in the jewelry box. They went over to the jewelry box, opened it up. There was, it wasn't in the jewelry box. They imported it from his house to Scotland, where we were demonstrating. It's a solid silver... Um, Figaro Marcus Seat butterfly, which they have a photograph of Heather wearing it. On the same night, they produced solid silver um, grape scissors because someone was traveling to France, leaving the United Kingdom to own a vinery, um, which I find quite interesting. So again, every airport must have a meaning. Stephen Trollen uh, had communication from his grandfather, and his grandfather says, I've got this for you, boy and it dropped down, and it's about that big, about that wide. And Stephen Trollan said, that belonged to my granddaddy. It went missing when I was a kid. So it showed that the other world had already prepared the app for before I was even born. This is showing the intelligence of the spirit world. Um, a lady called Jose Goschalk, um, She, her father came through on the anniversary of his fa uh, father's death. He was a coin collector. This is a silver doubloon franked 1780, and she lived in Holland. This is at Stansted. They produced the coin, dropped it. She then took it back to Holland. She went through her father's coin collection. And you know when you put felt, felt background, and you put coins on there, they fade, but if you lift them off, you've got a perfect color. There was a coin missing. When she placed it down, it was the same style as the coin that's gone missing. This is where it gets a little bit more embarrassing because you see the older photos of me. Look at those glasses. Look at them. Oh. They were that thick. If I went to a club and the laser hit them, someone had open heart surgery. <laughs> they were thick. Now, they were doing matter through matter. So this is where they get a solid object and then they put it through matter. So they did, we, were, we didn't have much money. So we made the tennis racket and it had a skin on it. So it was a drum. And Daniel said we could do something better than that and did this. So the wrists are still restrained. Um, there's a cable tie connected to the chair so I can't sit up. I am burnt on the back of the neck here. And I'm saying to the people, I'm a little bit uncomfortable. And they said, let's get a camera and just get a photo. They got the photo. And to get this off me, they had to saw it to break it to get it off. I was angry with them because they had broken something. I was traveling to Brighton. I had 15 pound on me, and I wanted to go to Brighton. For whatever reason, the train could not go to Brighton. I had to go to Lewis, which is a different direction, and catch another train to Brighton. I got to Lewis, and the next train was delayed for over an hour. So I decided to go to the second-hand shops, went into the first second-hand shop, started from the top. As I got to the top, there was a big Tibetan drum. 
and it was £15. So I paid the £15, had no money to get to Brighton, walked back to the station. As I got to the station, my train was pulling in to take me home. So I was like, oh, thank you, other world, but I wanted to go to Brighton. So the big drum that you see in Banyan is the drum that the spirit world replaced. Just quickly, again, uh, I'm burnt on the face here. Um, look how slim I was then. <laughs> matter through matter, so they take the legs through the arms of the chair. When they actually do this, I have a perfect luminous bruise around the leg where they've obviously taken wood through the leg or the leg through the wood. To get me out, they would then tip the chair back and then they'll cut me through and then slide me out. At the uh, Seekers Trust, and again at the Arthur Finley, they've done this on several occasions, where the legs have been taken both of them through and then they had to pull me and they wiggled me out slowly uh, to get it out. But this is matter through matter. We have been promised that in one seance they will take me through the wall. But I have to wait and for that because I said, well, why can't you take me to Scotland without me getting on the plane? That'd be easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Florence Cook, one time that um, uh, Katie King materialized, and they said, what would you like us to do with you today? And someone said, could you produce an apple, please? And they said, what would you like us to apple? And someone said, the medium Mrs. Glover. Mrs. Glover was sitting at her writing desk, felt funny, closed her eyes, and then woke up in the seance room. And then they apported a winter's coat and two walking boots. She had to put the coat on and the boots on because they couldn't take her home. So if she had to walk the three miles back to her house, the spirit person said, don't worry, the door will be unlocked for you. She was in her nightwear, so she had to walk three miles back. This is what they used to do. They used to decide to feed the fabric down my back. So I'd be tied to a chair, and then all of a sudden, the cabinet curtains would be thread down the back, normally knotted, and out the bottom. Again, at the AFC, they were changing the garden, and they had knotted all the curtains together, and there was about eight different knots. And as you unknotted each one, there was a piece of wood, which was from a different tree. And each of the, the uh, pieces of wood, they said, if you find the tree, this is what we want planted. So we were told what trees to plant at the Arthur Finley College. Moving quickly on, um, there's Darren. Look how young he looks. <laughs> you'll meet Nick and you'll meet Stephen on Sunday. They are part of my home circle, but they are the owners of Banyan Retreat in Ashford in Kent, where we met Sandra for the first time. This is Hazel, this is John, Lorraine, who almost died. Jan is now in the other world, and there's Sam down there. The empty chair is John Austin. We took this picture, hoping that he would appear on the chair, um, because this was the night he died. He wouldn't allow any of us to go and be around him. He said, go and sit. My journey's done. You carry on getting stronger. Get stronger for the unseen world. Um, this is ectoplasm. This was done in red light. This is a movable substance. Again, this looks like a rag. It comes out of the nose and the mouth, the eyes and ears and it connects itself to the trumpet, and off it goes. I'm rushing because I've got to end on a statement for you. So these were captured. We've got, in total, about 19 photographs. Um, we have had voice correlation. We have had hand molds. We have had stuff which has been put in boxes in a secret location, and they've apported that object from the secret location into the seance room. We've had loved one after loved one which has been tested. I have been filmed very briefly with a thermal imaging camera. We have tried with infrared, but I've been burnt. We have got a video of the uh, big chair that I sit in, the cushion pulling up my back and being thrown out the cabinet with the hands still tied. Um, I have been dropped in different locations of the room. Uh, they've done matter through matter. They have shown phenomena and a hand materializing in white light. And still, I want more for the other world. But when people say, we want it done like this, if we could do it like this, we would do it. We noticed that every time we did phenomena in light, we had no loved ones. The purpose of our demonstration is to get you up in the morning by hearing a voice that you recognize. That's the most important thing the reason why I should sit. It's not a circus. It's not a ego trip. It's healing the minds of those who need it. Now, years and years ago, I sat in Colin's seances, 
and my job was to place people in the room. So if you came in the room, I'd say, would you like to sit here, you sit there, you sit here, you sit here. Because we didn't have the raffle ticket system like I use in my demonstrations. Colin didn't know who was coming to a demonstration. Like I, I don't know who is coming to a demonstration at all. I don't want to know. That's why the seances that I'm doing here how it goes through Sandra, and I don't see the list, and I don't know who's coming in because I don't want to know. So this husband and wife walked in, and you didn't have to be psychic to know that something had gone wrong in their life. Um, but because they were unknown to me and I didn't feel exactly comfortable with them, I placed them at the furthest end of the room. Colin came in, we tied him to the chair, drew the curtain around there. I sat, say Colin is now there where the projector is, I'm here. Um, Nick McGlynn, Chris Hunt are all here who are regular sitters who I trust because we have to protect Colin at all costs. The lights had gone out. Within a few moments of the lights going out, the curtains bellowed open and you heard a voice saying, Mum, Mum, I know what you're planning to do, don't do it. Mum, it's Andy, I know what you're planning to do, don't do it. This woman who is on this side has started to scream. Andy is now walking past me. This woman is now hysterical. I know what you're planning to do. You try and tell a mother to calm down because I need her to be logical, rational, so she's not going to hurt my medium. I'm getting nervous because she's not listening. The scream is a quite a haunting scream. The husband is making noises. Andy is still talking. I'm now going to shout to Nick and ask for Magnus to come in to end the seance, because I've got to protect him. As I'm just about to shout out, Dolly the drag queen has walked out in a sequin dress, has come straight over to me and sat on me. She had a bony bum. Her hair was at the back, down to here. She's sitting on my lap, completely different to how Colin would feel. Once Dolly, our drag queen, has sat on me, I knew everything was going to be all right. For 15 to 16 minutes, they spoke in great detail. They hugged, they kissed. He said to his mum, Mum, do you remember when you cut my hair short back and sides? They carried on talking. There was other bits selling his bike, going off to Australia, etc. All this wonderful information. Dolly rose from me, and you heard whispering in the cabinet. And he said, Mum, they're calling me back. She said, don't you dare leave me. He goes, Mum, I haven't gone anywhere. As he's starting to walk away from his mum, after he kissed her and hugged her, and same with the dad, his legs are now dissolved. So this part of him is just left. We've joined hands to give him as much power as possible. At this point, he is about this much, and he's now going across my lap. He said, Mum, I know what you're planning to do. Don't do it. I love you forever, Mum. I've not gone anywhere. Bye. And went back into the cabinet. As human beings, we were crying, you know, because we are human beings. We're feeling the same pain that this woman is going through. We're going through her grief as well. Dolly walked out the cabinet with a sort of sound like she had a martini in her hand. She went, oh, the emotion. She goes, I hope you don't mind, my dear, but I've dyed his hair pink and purple. And all of a sudden, we've started to laugh, and the power has built back up, and then we can continue the seance. Colin's chair was dropped in front of me. Uh, we've released him, got him out. I went and got this husband and wife a cup of tea and a chalky biscuit because we can't send them out on the street. Anyone who knows about grief, there's an idiot zone around you because you turn around and say, are you OK? No, they're not OK. And I said to them that I'm going to say something really stupid but I just need to make sure you're OK. First of all, I'm so pleased that your son came and spoke, but did you recognize it? Yes, I did. And this is the story. Andy was going out on the night out. He had a massive aneurysm, and he died standing up. Literally, he just went standing up. What a way to go. But he had gone before he hit the ground. On the morning of his death, he went to his mum, said, Mum, can you cut my hair? Remember, Mum, short back and sides, and he brought that through in the communication. Why he was having his hair cut, he said to his mother, I'm thinking of having my hair dyed, either pink or purple. Dolly came through and clinched that bit of information for us. But what was more extraordinary, that they traveled the length and breadth of the United Kingdom, went and saw all these different mediums, and no one gave them the satisfying evidence of life after life. So they made a promise and said, if my son doesn't come through tonight, we're going to carry our journey from Hayward to Brighton and walk hand in hand into the sea. Mum, I know what you're planning to do. Don't do it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason why we sit. 
this is your motivation for you to sit and experience the wonderful power of the Spirit. It isn't for entertainment purposes. It's not to fill your pockets full of gold or silver. It's to heal people. And that's why I'm passionate about Sonia Rinaldi. She can do something far greater than what I can ever imagine. She has an opportunity to take it so, so far. This is why we must support this woman. This is the reason why we sit, not to get pictures like this, to have voices that are recognized. So I ask you now, what is your motivation why you sit? Only is between you and the Spirit. And I hope, sincerely, sincerely hope, that for in whatever way we are, we become the healers between the two worlds, healing the need of the bereaved and as well as healing the need of the Spirit. And I'd like to thank you on coming on the journey with me to whatever place we've gone to and wherever else you're going to be, that we don't die flagship or sail to many different shores and touch so many people. So thank you for listening to me. I've gone over time.